Uh, welcome to uh, everybody uh, this evening. Um, the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation is absolutely delighted uh, to be able to host um, this uh, evening's uh, event, um, a conversation uh, between um, Stephen uh, Romer uh, and Jamie uh, McKendrick. Um, this is a conversation that has been made uh, possible uh, by the uh, good work uh, and, and mediation of Dr. Adele uh, Badazzi, um, who is an IRC research uh, fellow at the Department of Battalion here in Trinity College, uh, Dublin, and an honorary uh, faculty uh, research fellow at the University uh, of uh, Oxford. Um, uh, Matthew Reynolds uh, was uh, unfortunately unable to, uh, to join us uh, this evening. Um, but we're absolutely delighted um, to have uh, Stephen uh, Romer uh, here uh, to uh, conduct uh, the interview, the conversation uh, with uh, Jamie uh, McKendrick. Um, uh, Stephen uh, was uh, educated uh, at, at Cambridge and spent uh, many years as a maître conférence at the University of Tours and he now lectures in French at Brasenose College in Oxford. Uh, many of you will know him as a poet, uh, a critic, and a translator, uh, and his area of speciality is Franco-British uh, uh, modernism. Um, his uh, bilingual collection, uh, uh, Jaune, uh, was published in France uh, last year, and he's currently preparing a collection of essays, Chaos and the Keen Line for Agenda, uh, which is coming out in 2023. And he's a Royal Literary Fund Fellow at the Faculty uh, of Medieval and Modern Languages, uh, Oxford. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Stephen now uh, to uh, introduce uh, our guest, uh, Jamie McKendrick. Stephen. Hello, can, can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you, Michael, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, yeah, I was delighted to be asked um, it was a bit late on, but that's fine because uh, I have uh, reviewed I, uh, Jamie's book and um, I'm a great fan. I should say that I should uh, come clean. Uh, I'll go back a bit. J Jamie and I um, are very old buddies. Uh, we were both poets in the um, on the OUP list years ago before that was sadly dismantled. Um, Jamie went on to Faber, <laughs> enviably. Um, and like most of you, I have always known and admired Jamie as a wonderful, wry, learned poet. Um, and since I benefited from his conversation <clears throat> over the years, I've always known that there was a, um, a formidable critical intelligence there. However, I don't think uh, any of us were prepared for um, the foreign connection, this astonishing collection of his essays over some 30 years published by Legenda. Um, and uh, I've certainly, I've certainly had no idea of the range of um, Jamie's interests, notably in the visual arts. I did know he wrote on art, but I, I didn't know the, the range or, also the wit and the urbanity of his um, criticism. It's a delight. Um, so, Jamie, without a, uh, further ado, um, the foreign connection, can you, um, I mean, there are various many ways into that uh, and your own witty introduction, um, describes it, but can, can you maybe describe it formally in, in terms of what exactly is it that these are essays, these are reviews, it's an in-gathering of different parts, and how did you envisage it? Um, yeah, I'd also like to thank Adele, uh, Michael, and um, Trinity for having me, and Stephen for that uh, over-generous introduction, but um, just a few words about the collection is that, yeah, I had the vague, slightly vain idea some years back of collecting together reviews. Uh, 
and I realized I'd been reviewing for quite a long time, you know, books of poetry, translations, and the visual arts. Uh, I had quite a good gig going for about 10 years with modern painters, uh, where they, it was a terrific kind of job to have. They'd send you off to uh, great places like the Venice Biennale or Paris, the Bobo, uh, and so on. So um, I gathered together a lot of things, but then I thought it doesn't actually make sense, this three-cornered book. <clears throat> but then when I filtered, got rid of quite a lot of reviews, I saw that the main preoccupations of the book emerged, okay? And therefore, <clears throat> I also felt that it needed some slightly more substantial essays to complement or to to go further than the reviews. I mean, I, I do like reviews. I like the idea that you're responding, particularly the slightly longer ones, you're responding on the hoof to uh, stimulus immediately. And, you know, you you do, I mean, there is the limitation of word length or, or space. Uh, anyway, I added about six or seven much longer essays uh, and two or three earlier essays that I'd done. Um, so that was the formation. And then they seemed to make, make sense together, loosely speaking, with an idea of translation. So movements from one art form to another. So the artists represented are often artists who are involved. They're not illustrative in the uh, derogatory sense. They're, they're dynamically involved with painting. So uh, with with poetry, so Botticelli's illustrations to uh, the Commedia, for example, is a starting point. Uh, Blake's uh, Blake is there more as an artist than a poet, but Blake's response to Dante, among other things, um, I think an artist very close to my heart is Odillon Redon and uh, his noir. Uh, things that have always interested me, and there's a lot of uh, import of Baudelaire. Uh, and so Baudelaire became a kind of organizing figure. He crops up all over the shop. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the essay, there is an essay on Whitman and Baudelaire, but, you know, even in Paul Muldoon, he, he arrives and in various other places. Baudelaire is a sort of tutelary spirit for, yeah, for the yeah, book. I, I remember you Jamie was writing amazing essays late on in the project, um, as I know, because he was carrying his battered penguin Baudelaire around with him and um, his battered loaf. Uh, La Rousse. La Rousse, yes, it was La Rousse. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was without translation, absolutely. It was, it was a battered La Rousse, great. Um, great, Jamie, well, look, to, let's, let's to order maybe give some idea what we're going to do. I thought um, we would start with matters arising from translation, uh, which is, of course, one of the central parts of the foreign connection, then probably go on to um, uh, what I call the recursive twist in your work, which is this rather lovely idea of the transmission of images um, from say the classics through the Renaissance, even to uh, more modern poets, right? This this passing of the baton of images, which is um, a really interesting um, Ariadne thread through this book. Uh, then perhaps we can talk about Baudelaire uh, and Bishop, and then go on to visual arts, and maybe if we have time, on to some your view of some some of the contemporary painters and poets. So um, if I can start with a quote, perhaps you could comment. Um, in your Sinister Experiments, which are some marvelous aphorisms, and I recommend them, some written in 2003-04 on translation. At one point you say, perhaps blind hubris and excitement at the outset and more humbled reflection in the reworking of the best conditions for translating. Um, I think you're referring to this uh, habit of versioning, mm. which is poets 
doing a riff, as it were, on um, European poets, um, compared to possibly, um, and also perhaps you could comment on the Heaney's wonderful uh, distinction between the um, the raider and the settler. The raider is the sm sort of smash and grab. A poet sees a fantastic poem by Baudelaire or Cobia or Montali and wants it a bit sort of lowerish, magpie-like. And the settler is the one who will um, settle down to doing a collected poems, say, of Montali. And so the the version, the, the, the approach may be different for various religions. It's, it's a really good way in that, <clears throat> um, in a response to that, I, I'm afraid I'll probably be coming up with all kinds of self-contradictory remarks, but in a way that little essay was quite dialectical in the sense that there was a proposition and a counter proposition. Um, so yes, in a way mediating between Seamus Heaney's Raiders and settlers, which I hadn't come across before, is a is an interesting way of putting it. Um, what, on one level, some of the writings I've made about translation look as if I'm being disapproving of uh, that nasty gerunda of uh, versioning. Um, actually, not uh, because some. Uh, I, th I think I share with you, Stephen, some of the. Uh, uh, admiration for quite a few of those poets who, mm. if you like, in, in Heaney's terms, are raiders. Um, and in a way, that's also where I started, you know, because uh, one of the first translations I did was uh, of one poem by a contemporary poet, um, Valerio Magrelli. Mm -hmm. And it, I just remember it's, it's a poem called La Braccio. And I just started thinking, how would this look in English? It wasn't like with any ambition to uh, come up with a thing. As it happened, it was quite easy for me to, it just worked in English. Um, subsequently with Magrelli, I started doing one or two more and found that they were much less easy. And I had to go, I had to deviate somewhat from, from the original in order to, if, if one can pretend that's the case, to, to stay true to some element, the spirit, if you like, of the translation, this is where it gets a bit vague. So I, I see it from both sides. When I started translating Magrelli, I did speak Italian, so I could, I could read it and anything that was difficult, I could work out. Uh, but I have translated from languages which I don't know uh, as, as one perhaps oughtn't to, but with the help of a, a native speaker. Mm -hmm. um, so I have seen it from both sides of the fence and I'm far from wanting to, um, to proclaim any hostility towards the, uh, the version, if you like, or something that has had, if it's the correct term, a bridge translation or basically an assistant. Uh, where I start getting annoyed is where people who are doing that start pontificating about the process of translation. Mm. Uh, and there's quite a lot of that going on now uh, from people who haven't ever had to grapple with the original language. They think that, and they, there are quite a few examples of a very belittling uh, approach to people who do know the language, whose translations they've used. Uh, so if, if you understand where the conflict I'm looking at occurs. Uh, it's like arrogance, maybe. Um, well, well, there is a sort of arrogance that goes back to Robert Lowell's uh, imitations. Yeah. I think that's the crucial text. You could go back further to Ezra Pound, um, whose, uh, whose Chinese translations I actually like very much, and I do like some of Lowell's but I don't like the tone of his introduction or uh, preface at all, uh, because I think it's aggressively defensive, you know? No, he's attacking, he's attacking the, the academic translators. Who yes, actually, yeah. Who, uh, and and, and yeah. Lowell, Lowell uses that uh, idea of tone um, in, in a very uh, problematic way. It's as if only the poet hears tone. 
uh, even if they don't know the language. Well, you only appreciate tone unless somebody's just shouting at you in Slovenian. Uh, you only appreciate the tone uh, by knowing the language. You know, so it's a completely uh, a nonsensical remark, it seems to me. Uh, uh, you know, like poets have some kind of antennae to pick up uh, tonality. I rather like another, can I quote, quote another thing you've written at you? <laughs> um, you, you developed the analogy rather nicely. Quality, questions of fidelity may be beside the point, all that traduri tradiri stuff we've heard so often before. Anyone would choose fidelity if it was the happiest condition, if it worked. It's when it doesn't and it isn't that the translator starts looking elsewhere, which I think is a rather pungently phrased. <laughs> it, it comes across as a wee bit cynical, actually. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no, in fact, uh, um, I, I mean, I think maybe if I just go back to the second translation I did of Magrelli, um, I did take liberties with, mm. because just some words became very flat in English, which were very lively in Italian. It's a strange thing. It's, I mean, in that particular relation, maybe Italian has a little bit more kind of Latin soul to it. I mean, I know we have the Latin aid, but you know, a word like segno for mm. sign, which, which vibrates from Cavalcanti onwards in Italian. It just sounds sort of vaguely semiotic in English, the sign. Uh, so yeah. I'm just giving that as an example. Yes. There are times when you have to go further afield. Uh, and uh, so I, kn I know the whole idea of fidelity is, is probably a, a very, very difficult concept because there is no such thing. You know, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence, even on a lexical level, let alone on a phrasal or sentence level, you know? Yeah. But the, the version is very tempting for a practicing poet like you are because, um, Certain theorists like Venuti um, talk about retaining a necessary um, awkwardness, uh, yeah. a foreignizing aspect. Um, and I think for those of us who've translated, it's very hard to know how you would do that when you're in you're in the full flight of vernacular translation. Where then would you put the brakes on? Yes. Um, and, <laughs> And, and how would you flag up at all moments that this is a translation? And do you actually need to? That, that, I think we've talked about this, about Venuti, particularly this. I think that's a point you brought up in, in your essay. I was very grateful for it because in some ways, not out of cowardice, but out of boredom, I'd steered round quite a few of the uh, uh, theoreticians of translation. Not that I'm entirely hostile to it, but if you take Venuti, yes, your idea um, that his idea that he works uh, very laboriously through is the notion of, uh, of making the translator visible through foreignizing, for, uh, through retaining foreignizing elements. Uh, I think it simplifies the, uh, the whole uh, process in, in a disastrous way. Uh, for reasons that would be, take a long time to go into, but one simple thing is that actually quite often poetry within a language is quite foreign to that language. So you're already dealing with, it's not just like, you know, the, the sort of politicization of it, which is that um, a language like English is a colonial language, et cetera, et cetera, all of which we know, um, but the, the a priori, a priori argument to try and uh, make difficulties uh, just just gets in the way often enough. Um, I, I, I'm expressing myself very badly here, but I think you might be able to follow what I'm saying, is that if you take, I mean, even a poet like Hardy, um, who you think is quite simple, so many local and peculiar words from the English uh, just get lost in translation. Mm. So somebody translating Hardy to make him sound anything better than a sort of ruralist English poet has got to find a way of, of uh, giving texture to the language. 
do, do you see what I mean? So even, I mean, if you took Hopkins, uh, he is Im immensely foreign to English. At the same time, he's really at the core of English. Um, mm. uh, and Hardy in a different way. I'm just taking two Victorians, but um, Hardy's English is very, very difficult. And the same goes, you know, you're translating Montali. There's something very, very particular about not just his Lexus, but his whole tonality, if we can use this term more legitimately here. Um, it's, it's, it's getting something that isn't just normal Italian. You know, it's a very strange Italian. You, you uh, are so the idea of foreignizing, you, you're dealing with two layers of foreign, you know. You, you are a poet translator very much, so you're a writer translation. I've just been, and I teach advanced translation theory. So I, I you know, I, I skirt, I mean, I too uh, bounce off it. And there are, you know, um, need a formal and dynamic equivalence foreignization, but there are useful, there are very useful terminologies often, taxonomies. Um, but as you tell, I think it's when it gets, it becomes painful and laborious and almost owlish that there's a problem, yeah. Anyway, um, Jamie, time passes. So could, um, I think what excites you possibly more about this book is, is, is um, the, what I call, I love your use of the word recursive, um, this notion of uh, images being passed forward or back almost like talismans. I think, you know, like when I think of the use of quotation and Pound and Eliot, um, so then your voice, that would be uh, modernist examples of, of these um, talismanic Dantesque or Cavalcanti phrases um, that, I've, that fascinates me. Um, but you, can, can you maybe, um, expand for our listeners your your notion of this uh, this other other central aspect of the foreign connection which which are this dis the discovery of these um talismans these whatever you like to call them Ar ariadne threads quotation um, yeah <clears throat> there's one i give as an example you know in the epilogue <clears throat> which is a very simple one but it, it's um it, it, if you like, it's a kind of passing on of a baton or a beacon from mm. one writer to another. But in the book, I look at it across art forms as well as through translation. So the last example I give is the very famous one where Dante um, in the circle of fire picks up a Cavalcanti image, the most beautiful image of uh, 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 snow falling uh, in the Alps without wind. Uh, in Dante, it gets transformed into this rain or snow of fire. Um, and I argue, I'm not sure anyone else has argued that, that the end of uh, James Joyce's The Dead, with its snow softly falling, uh, slowly falling, falling slowly, is a, a, a reprisal of that image, uh, the slow falling of the snow uh, on the living and the dead. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Joyce was a great scholar of Cavalcanti. He, Cavalcanti was one of his favorite poets and he knew Dante very, very well, as did Beckett. So <clears throat> that's just one example. Another um, might refer to Titian's use in uh, Bacchus and Ariadne of, um, mm. it, it has always been considered that Ovid was the source of that, but actually Catullus's Epilion is the accurate uh, source. Uh, I discovered that as an undergraduate and then found a bit later that it began to be because uh, uh, we were taught it was Ovid and I looked at Ovid and it was no there was many of the details missing. So that I mean that's across art forms. Uh, again you know there's another uh, uh, essay on uh, the music of Hot Boys uh, which is about Shakespeare's uh, use of Plutarch which is all very well known in Anthony Cleopatra and then as it gets used in Cavafy, it goes back to Plutarch and it comes up in Eliot again, the same uh, playful use of that image. Okay, the danger of this approach, uh, it's not really illusion spotting. The danger of this approach is that it becomes a, a, a poetry becomes a scholarly zone where it's only validated by 
the transmission of images. That's not what I'd like to argue because I, th I think uh, the transformation of, of images is like Dante's snow becoming fire is what's crucial. It's not merely marking a, you know, some, some classical illusion in, in work, which can be utterly dead. It's a, it, it's a reviv revivification. And I think behind the whole project is a bit of a notion in contemporary Britain of, of an increasing insularity. And I wanted to stress that sense of how much debt uh, English poetry has to French poetry, especially, uh, but also Italian poetry. And, and you know, so for example, uh, the Petrarch sonnet, uh, La Cerva, sorry, I've just gone out of my head. Um, uh, the, the sonnet about the deer mm. is translated, as we all know, by Wyatt's uh, Whoso List to Hunt, I know where it's at, and Hind. But I connected the Petrarch with a, a passage in Dante in the Purgatory, which I don't think has been uh, looked at, but there's a whole series of words, verde, maparve, etc., that are placed, as well as rhyme words. So my argument would be that Petrarch, in his inner ear, was reworking the passage of Dante. Uh, again, I'm kind of entering into a dialectic here by saying how significant it is, and yet, I wouldn't like to use this as a definition for originality in poetry, you know. So, I should, I should give some sense. These are, these are wonderful sh shortish essays, um, very much a poet's essays, full of wonderful quotations. And I think again of Eliot, who um, the shock of recognition. Um, uh, and that, you, you quote that beautiful, the, the, the Donna, um, Cinto d'Oliva Verdi and, and, and Vestito di Color di Fiamma Viva, whatever it is, my, my Dante is poor. Uh, but which, of course, feeds into your passion for color, Jamie, I have to say. I think um, it's no accident that these quotes are um, in, suffused with color because perhaps we'll get on to color later. Um, but you also have one on Catullus. You, you discover possibly um, a Catullan echo in Dante, which no one else has. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> this is where I get into a dangerous zone uh, because uh, as everyone knows, Dante's scholarship is, is uh, steered and, and, and underpinned by massive classical learning. So when I uh, asked a Dantista about the possibility of Dante reading, having read the Apillion by Catullus, um, it, it was immediately dismissed and uh, I was told Dante hadn't read Catullus. But actually there was a copy in the Paduan library when Dante was staying there. And it, it does seem to me quite likely he did see it. Uh, um, I mean, it, it would seem speculative, but my argument is based on textual similarities of that final great image of the Commedia when Neptuno, Neptune is looking up and sees the shadow uh, Lombre del Argo passing overhead. Uh, well, in, in Catullus, that's a Nayad's looking amira, amira, admira in, in the Catullus, looking up with admiration or, or with wonder at the same uh, uh, passage of the Argo. So, I mean, either it's a, a mighty coincidence or Dante, uh, as you say, like a magpie, had just gleaned this great image. But more interesting is that that's, that's 25 centuries uh, passing when Neptune, uh, since Neptune and all the world's knowledge comprise that happens in un momento, in a second. Uh, so it, it, it seems even better that he's also uh, including a Catalan reference or a classical reference within uh, that brilliant moment, uh, that huge metaphor. Um, yeah, the uh, metaphor itself, uh, as you I know, means carrying of, over. Yeah. I love the idea of Dante picking up the Carmine. must have been a very first edition. <laughs> anyway, um, I do want to make clear that uh, Jamie doesn't 
never has the true pedant, the true scholastic stink, to quote Joyce about it. It's all, it's all likely, it's likely worn and it's beautifully done. Um, these suggestions really, and they're always done with deference and um, absolutely the opposite of pompous. Um, um, Even if I'm sounding pompous now. I mean... No, no. Uh, there's also a very comic, wonderful account of the Paradiso, which describes Beatrice giving Dante what seems to be like a combined honours course. Um, <laughs> and then Dante is sitting a vive <laughs> with, with the... Well, yeah, he has, has his catechism. Uh, um, there is a, a kind of severity about Beatrice, um, yes. which is sort of slightly comic actually in a way because he's being uh, reproached like a little schoolboy yeah so um, there's great there is great humor um in your but then then you come up let me quote something else i love this um that the ascent of purgatory is a spiraling movement that unwinds something within straightening what has been twisted um unsolving the self that the world has deformed so the spirit may ascend towards the light. Um, so that lovely notion of, uh, perhaps you read that somewhere, is that yours? That, that, that actually climbing the, the, Mount Purgator, the Mount Purgatory is also unwinding the twisted timber of humanity. Um, there is a quotation uh, in which Dante speaks in exactly those terms of, a, yes. of an unwinding. Uh, uh, yeah, of of the whole purgatorial process. So, in a way, my commentary is um, is definitely um, it, it's it's a couple of lines. Salendo e rigirando la montagna, mm. che uh, is it? Che drizza voi uh, uh, che il mondo fece torti that untwist you mm. who the world has twisted. So it's it's like an uh, an unwrapping of a, a helical structure. And I do think that, that that kind of actually quite visual image uh, is, a, is a motor for the poem. Um, and you finish beautifully saying, um, you know, Dante brings, what does he bring to Paradiso? Well, he brings the vernacular and he, he, he Tuscanizes heaven and he humanizes heaven. So yeah, that, that that's uh, in dealing with the Paradiso, where yes. I think often it's approached as as this very distant. I, I think it's probably the least read of the Canticles uh, in English, where, where most of the translations and most of the uh, attention has been focused on the Inferno. Uh, so it was a nice opportunity to write about well, in both of the essays, one about. Poetry and one of our paradiso, but, but yes, you do, it, you do it with grace and and but also um, grace, wit, but also some um, profundity. I think um, it's not not easy to write about the paradiso. Um, no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, if you just moving on to the color that you mentioned before, I think the yeah the yeah, that's the other side of the book. I mean, it starts with. Uh, Bordichon and Bordichon is a French miniaturist, a Botticelli Titian, but it goes into the contemporary world of, it goes up to Luke Toymans and uh, Arturo Di Stefano to, to contemporary uh, uh, painters of our generation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be good to turn to the, the visual arts, which is a, um, I just reread preparing for this, the, 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 the essay on Velasquez. Um, and in which you mention the extraordinary Welsh painter Thomas Jones, the 18th right. Welsh painter who, who was famous for genre pieces, um, um, sort of, you know, mythological monstrosities as all the painters were. But as is now well known, he also did these sketches, notably the wall in Naples, um, which you mention uh, and you beautifully talk about the portraits of unregarded things. Um, yes. and, and that, that, talking of the French, that, um, that painting has become iconic for certain French poets recently. The, 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 oh, is that right? The, 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 um, 
maybe maybe they're thinking of Le Petit Pont de Mirjone in Proust. So th these, this notion of color, and let me just quote you, only someone who perceives color as a kind of absolute could dwell on it could dwell on it as emphatically and as unhurriedly as Elizabeth Bishop does in her poems. And I, so I said, sorry, a question, it's a statement you can comment on. Color as a kind of absolute, Jamie, is. is um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the particular instance was in Bishop, there are quite a few lines that, just mark one color after another. It's like a list of colors, which, you know, she writes short poems. So it's a very extravagant uh, expenditure of, of words, just to, to, you know, the end of the Sandpiper, for example, uh, which talks about the tan, the black and the white, and then yeah. the rose and amethyst at the end. Um, but she does that again and again. And, you know, I think it is testimony to her very exact sense of color. And of course, Elizabeth Bishop, though she would never have uh, taken on the title as uh, of, of painter, was a very, very gifted visual artist. Mm. And only after her death, I think modesty prevented her doing it before. And uh, that hasn't stopped one or two poets from exhibiting the work, but they were gathered together in a very beautiful uh, book called Exchanging, be beautifully titled book, called Exchanging Hats, that refers to her, a poem of hers, uh, mm. but she's putting on a different hat. And three or four of those images are fantastically strong. Uh, I'm not answering your um, question about the absolute because it's um, maybe it's a step too far, but, but the, the color has, has this, uh, I feel like an absolute vibration to, particularly for those colorists, you know, so I've, the, the painters I've written about, like Velázquez, Titian, uh, up to the modern period, I think of those painters who are responding with great vividness to colour. Um, the well, Jones picture is a relation, of course, to the uh, Velázquez um, painting, which is a very original and unique painting of a little bit of a wall in the Medici gardens. So that's my, my link with the Neapolitan kind of derelict, decrepit bit of wrecked stucco, you know. You may not want to answer that question directly, but I'm going to just read some of your quotations on colour, which probably answers it for you. Um, uh, here we are. This is Jamie on a selection of painters. Um, the water is composed of brief flicks of mauve and milky violet, which link it compositionally to the roof slates and the fir branches on Bishop. Behind a promontory in the same ochre divided blue, strip, blue strips of sea and sky. Those two blues, a cerulean and an ultramarine, were pitched at odds with each other. Painting by Wilhelmina Burns, Barnes Graham. The she didn't like that apparently. The <laughs> mauve pink tinge of the upper story, as well as the far right pink give promise of a radiant day beyond the shadowed walkway on Arturo di Stefano's recessed colonnades. So um, it seems to me that McKendrick also um, has a good, puts, let, let us say at least puts enormous uh, value on color as a phenomenon, as a vibration, as a Baudelaire. Sm a small footnote is that uh, Wilhelmina Barnes Graham apparently was quite annoyed by my description of those two blues being at odds with each other. Maybe I should defer to her as a better colorist, but uh, uh, anyway, um, it was too late, it was published. Um, but again, you, you, I can't resist the humor. Blake, in one of Blake's uh, illustrations, lion looking like a gonk with a perm. <laughs> <laughs> with all due respect, it was written. Yeah. <laughs> On Modigliani, his amorous homages to the female form and face seem like outposts of Quattrocento and Renaissance ideals. On Giacometti, quote, heroic commitment to the human form and all its menaced frailty. Um, Luke Timons, 
um, his Congolese context interrogates the poisoned ambiguities of our way of knowing what happens. Uh, I mean, it's not a bad way of giving our listeners this, something of the savor of um, James' book with these, these um, extraordinarily uh, pithy quotes. And, and, and I would second what he was saying about the, re the review, the brief review as being, you know, the, all the advantages of pithiness, um, concentrated response, dealing with the matter in hand, not, not, not too many divagations, not too many scholarly periphrases, really getting, uh, and, and, in, and in visual arts, going to the colour, I think, is, is, is remarkable. Um, so one thing that struck me about the book was the accuracy and the, the copiousness, really, of your art criticism. I mean, you, your association with modern painters went on for how many years, Jim? Uh, ten years, <laughs> staying in fancy hotels and yeah. being paid, which is a, a bit unusual for yeah. when you think of doing poetry reviews. So it's a glimpse of another world. So. <laughs> no, no, but it was a great opportunity to look at some art. And yeah, as is any type of review, paid or unpaid, it's, it's a chance to focus where you, you, you'd you read a book anyway, but if you have to articulate something about it, um, it might not, it might be an ephemeral thing, but I'd like, I'd like to think that stuff I've kept in the book has, you know, it's judgments that I stand by. I, I guess you'll be doing the same in a way because I think your book of essays will be inclusive of reviews as well as longer essays. Yeah, that's a work in progress, Jamie. <laughs> Do you think it's we ought to um, conclude so that if there are any questions, uh, um, but Stephen, thanks very much for your attentive reading of it. It's very gratifying. Well, thank you. Yes, I'm sure there, you know, there, there are um, questions. I don't know um, how we're doing, Michael, for time or whatever. Yeah, no, no, we're we're, we're good uh, time-wise, and I suppose just wanted to kind of uh, renew the invitation to uh, to our listeners and watchers this evening um, to uh, submit a question to the, uh, the chat box that would be uh, extremely uh, helpful. Um, maybe I just, one of the things that occurred to me in listening to the, uh, to the conversation where I mean, what, what Stephen brings out, Jamie, in, in, in your writing is, is that kind of, that range of, of of, of reference uh, and interest, but also, I think, underpinned by a, um, a, a an almost kind of ethical concern uh, or preoccupation with what happens when culture is closed down. You know, when when the openness uh, stops, and 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 so one of the things that characterise a lot of the kind of the, the modernist giants, I mean, Joyce and and Wolf and Stein and so on was precisely that that you know the 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 intro in the interest in uh, other languages and and and, and literatures and, and do, do you feel that there's uh, that there's been a kind of retreat from the ambitions of that literary modernism and and that uh, there's a kind of um, a, a shrinkage not just kind of aesthetic but political in our societies as a kind of result. Yeah, I, your example of Joyce is, is a supreme example of somebody, I mean, whatever your response to Finnegan's Wake, it's like he's forged a language out of five or six languages. Uh, I'm sure you'd be more aware of the Irish element too. Uh, but, but yes, um, and in terms of the contemporary British culture, I don't know, I mean, in, in a sense, I was a bit of a victim of it because at school, I, I got a smattering of Latin. Um, actually, that was well taught, but modern language is practically nothing. Uh, so I, you know, it was, it's sort of by chance that, that living in Italy, I learned Italian, then learned Spanish, and I've kind of kept up the French a wee bit. So yeah. I'm just, I'm not particularly a good uh, advert for, for that openness, but indeed this book is an attempt to make that case for, a, uh, I mean, you know, Europe in these last five days has been under a particular kind of 
uh, crisis uh, and rather terrifying one. Uh, but but I think Brexit has been very very uh, has had very bad adverse not merely commercial significance as they are but cultural effects. I mean, you know, actually the teaching of modern languages in British universities is looks increasingly under threat. Uh, it looks like a dispensable subject. It's been it's been a process that's going has been going for some while. I think there are other people here better qualified to speak about that. Uh, but it is very wor worrying to see those consequences. Yes, um, how they're reflected in the art and the poetry. I think poetry keeps alive that interconnectedness. Uh, um, there's a question um, here, um, which is about, um, did you have a kind of uh, uh, an imaginary or, or, or target audience in, 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 in mind um, when you uh, were putting the essays uh, together? I mean, was there a kind of an imaginary reader or were there kind of a, a multiplicity uh, of, of, of different, diff different readers? I mean, did you... I, um, I think partly the style, if it can be called the style of writing, is that uh, is open to anyone really. I, 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 I um, it's not written in a highfalutin idiolect. I hope, though, I don't want it to be simplifying issue technical issues. You know, um, so yeah, I somehow. For poetry, I never think there's an audience. <laughs> there isn't one, you can be sure. Uh, no, but I don't think you direct anything to an audience, but I think in a way for criticism, I, I never think of an audience really, which, which may be the problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'd like it to be accessible. Uh, that's a, a dodgy word to use. I'd like it to be readable uh, for anyone. Uh, and I mean, I must say that the critics that I most admire uh, uh, generally are, are extremely readable. Uh, you know, I would, I would include, though I take a few swipes, as Stephen points out, uh, uh, he, uh, unjustly at Eliot. I think most of Eliot's criticism is very, very readable. And, um, and that would go for practically every, every good critic uh, up to the present day. I mean, I find Seamus Heaney's essays immensely enlightening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a great admirer of Tom Paulin's essays. Uh, uh, you know, I, I just think it's, it is an obligation to, to, to keep your work open to people. Uh, and that does not mean simplifying it. No? Um, These are poet, poet, poet critics in particular, don't you? Yeah. A poet critic. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a question here uh, from uh, Daniel Bagazzi. So I was wondering whether Jamie would like. I was wondering whether Jamie would like to tell us more about um, his own creative work, poetry, or how um, his own creative work, poetry, and the visual arts speak to each other. I'm thinking about the role of the images in the years and how they're not merely uh, illustrations to uh, to Jamie's poetry. Um, so um, this kind of dialogue, you know, between uh, the, the visual arts and, and your own creative uh, work, uh, Jamie. Yes, yeah, th thank you for the question. Um, for me, it's been two separate activities. Maybe like a glorified Sunday painter. I've I've done, uh, and I never found I would be writing poems when I was doing pictures and vice versa. So. In other words, the two activities seem to interfere with each other. Um, it doesn't sound like a happy uh, a psychic state I'm describing. But just at this time, I suppose, of doing these essays, I decided for the first time to, uh, almost the first time, to put images with uh, poems. So this book, uh, The Years, if it's visible, I don't know, um, has like a, let me try and find a picture. Um, a picture next to each poem. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, so that just to explain the reference, uh, that's a, if it's not visible, a heron beside the swimming pool. Um, 
looking miserable, uh, looking a bit like Baudelaire. No, uh, then so I, I, as I say in the introduction, I was interested to unbuild the wall I'd built between them uh, on the no notion that uh, uh, bad fences make good neighbors. You know, so I it, this was a, a departure for me. Uh, but th then I think it was facilitated by writing the essays, which were making the interconnections between the art forms, between painting and, and uh, poetry. Uh, There's um, another question here from um, Barb Milner. Um, said, and sh um, so Barb is asking, could you elaborate a little <clears throat> on, on Hardy's very, very difficult uh, language. Um, so yes. That reference there to say a little bit um, more about, about that. I think I have a quote here from, from the essay, um, which might help. I, I was just looking at an Italian translation uh, and that's behind what I was saying rather ineptly is uh, Hardy's and afterwards. It's about envisaging life after his death. When the present has latched its postern behind my tremulous stay and the May month flaps its glad green leaves like wings, delicate filmed as new, so, new spun silk. Excuse my bad reading, but that just gets entirely lost when you lose the postern, becomes porta in Italian. Um, and then you get this line of monosyllables the May month flaps its glad green wing leaves like wings. And then the delicate filmed new spun silk. I mean, this is just one example, those two compound adjectives you couldn't do in Italian. This is not, I mean, every language has its strengths, but it's the peculiarity of Hardy's language that looks so natural and is quite unnatural to English was part of my argument. You could find so many examples in Hardy that, I mean, nothing is untranslatable, but that really puts a, a huge burden on the translator. Um, is, you know, a phrase like, it, uh, it's blast beruffled plume. Try putting that into Italian or Spanish or French for that matter, uh, with the alliteration and this extraordinary energy at the end of the poem. I mean, I, we could go on forever about uh, Hardy's language. Uh, but it's not just the dialect elements. The dialect elements may not be the most difficult. It's the peculiar twists and turns of his language. It's a very good question. I'm sh sorry it's too brief an answer. Um, there is uh, an, an, another um, sort of <clears throat> question, comment from um, here from Chris Miller. Um, is the publication of relatively disparate essays is slightly uncommon these days. One ex expected to write a book yeah. uh, with all the unity that this implies. Uh, would you see that expectation as rather restrictive? In other words, the, the, the kind of the, the livre thèse, as they say in French, that you know, there must be some kind of central, uh, and, and that it's, it's the, the particular variety of the essay forms, what, what, what attracts yeah, you? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I really take the point. I, I think the, age when writers were allowed to write their book of essays, you know, which would be a gathering of all kinds of things, has pretty well passed. Um, maybe if you're quite a famous novelist, you can do it. I mean, because I do see one or two of those, uh, you know, often very good collections. So yes, I see it as restrictive and I see it as a loss. Um, in, in my sense, I'm, I have made an effort not to write necessarily a book, but uh, at least given a pretense of unity to it, because I have very much, I mean, I've organized it chronologically. I've, uh, you know, it's just 2000 years, so it's not much of a, a clear chronology with lots of huge gaps, which I would love to have filled in. Um, but yes, your point stands, uh, Chris, is that yes, I, I think, um, I mean, just the very fact that I've had to go um, to a, a very kind academic press uh, and it's priced the book out, out of the market though it will be a paperback i have to say um one uh, high academics four academics <laughs> yeah well you there's a there's a year yeah. lag uh, but but that's a pretty inaccessible book if it's going for 75 pounds but yeah there was a day when 
like Faber would publish, uh, you know, uh, essays by its poets, and that's gone. Presumably, it's a it's a commercial decision that they're not selling. I mean, the only one of our generation uh, who uh, publishes essays with uh, Faber is Michael Hoffman. I can sort of see he's a very brilliant, extraordinary critic as well as poet. So it's good at least the doors ajar for one person. But other really good writers from Faber, like Mark Ford, his essays are, are really exceptional, uh, have had to go through smaller presses. You know, uh, I'm sorry to get into publishing here, but but I I think you're essentially right, Chris, that uh, it's become very restrictive. And actually, though I don't do enough of it, I think the essay form is a very important, vital form to have a um, a forum for criticism. Uh, you know, not just for kind of bland reviews in the Sunday papers, but some something a bit more investigative. I think America still has the door open a bit more. You know. If I could just jump in there and say, I think to, to defend your, yourself against yourself, Jim, I think towards the end, there's a, there is a, we didn't get onto it, there's a section on your contemporaries, um, Muldoon, Paulin, Fenton and others, and, and Hoffman. Um, and that is, you know, that that is some that is that is it's not it's not exhaustive, um, but those are chapters you could go to as you would to a book, uh, to a, to a sort of, um, you know, a, a more logically so-called constructed book because there are if you want, McKendrick on Muldoon is trenchant, McKendrick on Hoffman is trenchant, and there they all are, which is a great advantage. I mean, there is, I think there's a lot to be said for this, um, actually, the engathering of thoughts um, that are diachronic as well. That they, you know, they, they, it's a span of a, his opinion. And I find him to be a, a I mean, his, his gift for quotation, I say, is a fiduciary of good judgment. And he, and he quotes extremely well. And his comments, even in these brief pieces, are worth many pages of more Thank academic you. books. Voila. Thank you. If I could um, just, um, maybe in, in, in conclusion, and um, in response to, to a question or a comment from up in the chat, um, the, the, the question of, 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 of translation, is this, you know, uh, is it a translation center? And, um, you know, so the, the question of, of translation that, 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 that Stephen brought up earlier in, in the conversation, um, do you, I, I suppose, Jamie, do, do you see um, translation really as that kind of central organizing metaphor of what it is that 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 that, that you do, or is, is is translation kind of one of uh, a series of different activities, art criticism, literary criticism, translation, or is is, is, is translation kind of like a, a sort of superordinate term that takes takes place in all of this? Um, it's, a, it's a good question, really, because I actually, for me, translations has become, from being a very peripheral activity, has become quite central. <clears throat> I mean, I've spent 10 years translating very slowly six books of uh, prose by Giorgio Bassani, um, this isn't a proper answer, but it's saying, um, you know, that translation seems to be uh, more than just a metaphor of uh, carrying across from one culture to another. It's, it's uh, and in, in a way, the essays are trying to look at, you know, the dynamic um, and creative effects on a culture. You, you know, like, uh, it's a almost cliched example that Wyatt and Surrey's translations of Petrarch are kind of the beginning of the sonnet tradition in English. And there's particularly Husso Lister Hunt, but also My Galley Charged with Forgetfulness by Wyatt, are superb acts of translation that have, uh, they, they deviate uh, particularly Husso Lister Hunt from radically from Petrarch, uh, but it, it is essential to that whole English lyric tradition, that contact with Italy. So if, I, if that's a better answer, I, I would say, yes, it's, 
it is an overarching uh, image for the book and translation of different forms, you know, to different art forms of uh, an image in Catullus to Titian uh, and, or an image in Dante to Blake, uh, because uh, the visual arts are also a, a reinvention, a critique of the original. I mean, Blake is quite hostile to Dante. I think he became closer to him, but I think there are things that uh, that he that he found repellent in Dante. So, so there is a criticism involved in that too, or an independent creation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, translation itself is a kind of a dialogue form of criticism, or or. Or analysis. It can be. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so um, un un unfortunately, um, we have uh, run out of, of, of time, but I think I, on behalf of everybody um, who's been listening and watching uh, tonight, um, I want to thank um, Stephen and Jamie for uh, a, a wonderful uh, conversation, a conversation that was uh, insightful, uh, erudite and ir irreverent and I think um, certainly for many of us um, here um, it's uh, something uh, on the foot of this conversation um, I think you're going to have many more readers uh, of the book whether they'll wait for the paperback edition wait for the paperback. Or, or make that investment in the half we, we, not even my granny would buy it at that price yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, so um but i think um i would uh as i said very much like to thank um stephen and and and, and jamie you're absolutely uh, delighted to host this conversation tonight uh, and again uh, i would like to thank uh adele bandazzi um for the, the work that she did to make uh, this uh, evening uh, possible so that's a million daily for uh, that was very much um, uh, appreciated um, so uh, we hope that you've uh, enjoyed uh, the uh, event uh, tonight um, and that uh, you go to our website tcd.ie literary uh, forward slash uh, literary uh, translation to uh, get uh, information about uh, other uh, events uh, we also are present on Facebook and, uh, and, and Twitter. And um, for those of you um, who are particularly interested uh, in supporting the activities uh, of our center, you can become a friend of the Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation. And you can find all of the information uh, on how to become uh, a friend and uh, the benefits um, at that section uh, of our website that relates to, to friends. Um, so, Garmi and Magiv, as Tiach and Shah and Nacht, and uh, wishing you all uh, a very uh, pleasant evening. And thanks again to uh, our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.